Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. Today it's the return of the five album series and today I'm doing five albums to get you into post-punk. Post-punk is a genre that, if the name hadn't already occurred to you, uh, is inspired but is a natural progression on from the punk movement of the 1970s. Bands that were kicking out against trend, tradition and establishment and forming a new genre of music and political protest. Post-punk artists took the philosophy of bands like Buzzcocks, Sex Pistols, The Clash, Ramones, and took that music to new experimental heights. You know, despite punk kicking out against the system, the music was relatively accessible melodically. So the bands of the late 70s, inspired by punk, but wanting to move forward musically, started experimenting with song structures, strange rhythms, unique vocal performances, angular guitar riffs, different kind of production techniques. Together, these bands developed a style of performance that, although seems less aggressive on the surface, is more progressive, more exploratory, more forward thinking, and this is what is known as post-punk. Since the original post-punk movement in the late 1970s, early 1980s, there are so many bands that could probably fit into the categorization of post-punk, but as with any homogenous, music genre label description it's very difficult to fit these into specific areas you know for example there's a 21st century band that might sound like post-punk they could also be labeled as art rock you know those labels are difficult when, as we start moving into the 21st century as bearing that in mind i'm basing my five picks today on the original post-punk movement of the late 1970s so those bands will come from there obviously there are other bands that come on later that you could consider post-punk but I want to talk about the the original movement really. Also I just want to remind some of you at the start of this this is five albums to get you into post-punk. I've tried to pick these with an idea to help someone get into the genre so they can explore it more themselves so I've picked five albums that I feel best reflect the modes and sounds of the style of music that we're talking about. So before you say they're obvious, I know they're obvious picks, that's the point. That's, that's the point of this series in a way, is to try and pick out the gems of the, of the genre, of the movement, so people can then go and dig deeper themselves later. With that in mind, I've obviously had to miss out a loads of wicked post-punk albums, brilliant records. If you've got a favorite album I haven't spoken about, then make sure you talk about it down below and let the community know those records. Um, and also I've done two Spotify playlists, one with the five albums I'm talking about today and then one with more albums to get you into post-punk. So hopefully the ones I haven't discussed that you want to talk about will be in there as well. Number one, Joy Division with Unknown Pleasures, released in 1979. So I'm probably starting with one of the most widely recognised, widely regarded classic albums, not just across post-punk or even music of the 20th century, but just across all forms and all mediums. Like This thing is just known as a classic record, and for good reason too. Joy Division's 1979 debut record is an isolating, frosty, sparse record that maintains its status as one of the most inventive records ever made uh, and also a great example of post-punk as a form of music. Vocalist Ian Curtis famously hung himself in May of 1980 and that draws a layer of gloom across the already emotive and dour music that the band created. The existential angst and brooding intensity of the tracks here just as they're so palpable and they really hit you like a gut punch on the first listen. The band's stark outlook wasn't just a retrospective layer though acquired by Curtis's suicide. I mean after all the band name is named after a Nazi concentration camp sex slavery ward from the book House of Dolls released in 1955. Yeah heavy stuff. Producer Martin Hannett's present on the album is utterly crucial. A forward-thinking talent who provided a lot of key techniques to the band that really became part of their music. Things like echo, delay, various filters, uh, looping, as well as early transcendent synthesizer tones. So there's a lot there that really became part of Joy Division's sound and it's thanks to him. Hannett was also very passionate about recording separate waveforms to create a song. So sometimes he'd even just record the individual drums in a drum beat and then put everything together in post-production and what that does is that creates a spatial awareness between the instruments and basically develops that <coughs> develops that clean expansive sound that the record has these sounds are clearly an experimental leap from the british punk scene of the 1970s you know they may have been inspired by those punk bands but more in energy and less so in their musicality 
The popular instrumentation of punk music is here, but it's twisted and disfigured into an unrecognisable new form. You have most of the guitar work is clean rather than distorted. You have uh, bass taking precedent in terms of the uh, melodies rather than guitar. Uh, you have um, some of the drums are more looped and industrial rather than loose and organic like they would be from the work of uh, punk drummers like Topper Heedon and Paul Cook. Bass lines are left to just drive the track forward alone, and that's such a key feature to Joy Division sound and a lot of post-punk sounds, allowing the bass to really have its own musical identity rather than just copy the root note of the chords and the guitar. So that's a really, uh, really unique part of the post-punk sound. Just listen to the rasping bass on the opening of the track Disorder to hear that bass in action. There's so many gorgeous flourishes to the record. You know, drummer Stephen Morris's snare that, that echoes and cuts through the murk on opening track Disorder. That ostensibly post-punk trebly tone of Peter Hook's bass in Interzone. Curtis's low rumbling vocals on She's Lost Control, which is just seething with anxiety. A bleak but beautiful record. You need to experience this. And then once you have experienced it, you need to go and listen to Closer, their second and final and perhaps best album. I don't know. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment. Thoughts? I don't know what a thought is. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Do you prefer Unknown Pleasures or do you prefer Closer? Number two, Wire with Chairs Missing, released in 1978. If Unknown Pleasures is arguably the most accessible entry into post-punk, then Chairs Missing is your first taste of something a little bit more challenging. Chairs Missing was released a year prior to Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures, and what the band did was they moved on from their 1977 debut Pink Flag, which had like a sharp punk resonance, and they moved on and embraced synthesizers, ambience, and guitar effects. This record introduces another factor of the post-punk form, which is uh, often a dark humour and a wittiness to the music. The band were very aware that their debut was sonically very close to punk, but different in its philosophy. And you know, there's a heavy dose of irony and sarcasm on the tracks on display and chairs missing. Just check out these lyrics. So truly jolly, an Xmas dolly. I talk on request, I'm never depressed. I'll wink a good time till someone pokes me one big blue eye out. This record also brings to the fold the disjointed, jagged, jarring musicality of post-punk. And it's displayed pretty well in the opening track, Practice Makes Perfect. You have this soft bass line and out of nowhere this serrated, jagged guitar chord just comes smashing into the track. And not before long it's joined by this clipping, echoey drum rhythm. About halfway through the track it evolves into even more unsettling territory. You have this maniacal laughter sample, ambient synths and Colin Newman's vocal gets more uh, progressively agitated and coarse throughout. The great thing about this record is that the first track doesn't and cannot represent the album as a whole. You know, the 15 tracks that make up Chairs Missing flux in intensity and tone, shifting all the time, and it just proves the commitment that the band has to make original music. Being Sucked In again opens with a space rock vibe before it kicks into this almost twee bass and guitar melody. I say almost because there's just it's almost twee, but there's something about it that just unsettles, and I think it's probably the staccato vocals from Newman that just fragment themselves over the track. It just creates a very strange atmosphere. Outdoor Minor is only 1 minute 44 seconds, but it manages in that time to harness this sunny disposition with these beautiful, harmonious backing vocals. The whole thing is just this melancholic, whimsical, feel that it almost sounds like shoegaze, although you know, this, this song precedes the style and the movement of shoegaze by about 10 years. This album is the sound of musicians respecting the music of punk but wanting to take that energy one step further, creating music that's unique, alienating to many, unsettling, funny, original. And those words really do sum up the genre of post-punk quite well. Number three, Magazine with Real Life, also released in 1978. Magazine are a British post-punk band that were formed from the original lineup of the influential first wave punk band Buzzcocks. Howard Devoto, who was the frontman of Buzzcocks for around a year, eventually left and decided to form Magazine, who became really a staple of that post-punk sound. They're such a crucial band to this whole movement. 
Famously, Devoto told his fellow buzzcocker Pete Shelley that he wasn't stupid and refused to pretend to be. <laughs> so that set him on his journey to discover um, a new style of music that, that became Magazine Sound. Real Life is Magazine's debut album and wow, what a debut it is. The thing that really catches me off guard with this record is its vibrancy and its energy. You know, the thing constantly throws curveballs, not just track to track, but within the individual tracks themselves. Opening track Definitive Gaze has this synth line that sounds more proggy than anything else, really, and it gives the track such a cheeky personality. And if you think that the majority of the rest of the track is relatively simplistic, look out for the middle eight, which has this these atonal piano chords and these bubbly popping synth sounds. Also that synth is crucial to the incredibly catchy riff that the whole track is centered on. And the whole thing just, it really sticks in your mind. It really, it's, it's so well written that it can be unique and interesting and left field, but it also, it just sticks in your head like a good pop song does. Shot by both sides is almost the most pedal to the floor track on this record. Check out Recoil for that. But it's also their relatively most simplistic song on the album too. <clears throat> And you can just tell that the band really revels in that simplicity. Um, Ma drummer Martin Jackson's 16th note drum fills have this intensity to them. Uh, John McGeoch's ascending chorus melody and joyous guitar solo. And then you have Devoto snarling, I wormed my way, shot by both sides. It's just so infectious. That tempo increase on Motorcade is epic, framing Devoto's treated vocals. Here is your man, all faces turn unanimously. The small fry who sizzle in his veins in all security. This track is a great representation of the frenetic quality of the album. The, the tempo changes and the mood shifts, it goes from something that's pensive to aggressive to chilling. Each twist is unexpected. The off-kilter drunken synths on track Parade closes out the record in a suitably wonky, idiosyncratic way. Uh, you have piano, chord pedal guitar effects, and also sax as well. And, and the, the fact that they uh, are willing to use any musical instrumentation necessary in order to get across their musical intentions, uh, that just displays a brazen confidence that makes this album what it is. In a word, brilliant. Number four, Public Image Limited, Metal Box, also released in 1979. Here's another band born from the ashes of punk. When the Sex Pistols split up, the frontman John Lydon, also known as Johnny Rotten, he went and formed the band Public Image Limited, a band that I would argue released the most challenging and innovative music under the post-punk label in the late 1970s. If this record was released in 2017, it would sound as urgent, otherworldly and challenging as it did in 1979 and that's amazing really because how many albums can you say that about you know this really is a unique record metalbox is public image limited's second album and it came at a time where the band were almost unable to cobble together enough money to even produce the album itself a lot of the money had gone on the conception of the metal box the physical metal box that it was released in and the concept for the album all was based on that initial idea and then the music came later and what the band ended up doing was um, sneaking into recording studios at night and recording snippets of tracks as and when they could and uh, in the daytime the studio was was operated by uh, bands that were paying for it and they were finding ashtrays all around the place and uh, little uh, little clues that someone might have been using the equipment at night um, so that's the kind of uh, story of the legacy of this album it also sounded like quite a difficult band to keep focused Lydon has before talked about the explosive outbursts between bassist DR Wobble and guitarist Keith Levine uh, and despite that friction that was going on between band members they managed to create an album that carves out something that's so defiantly unique and also something that sonically mirrors and embodies that idea of the metal box. The opening track Albatross kicks off that metallic aesthetic uh, with the hi-hats and snare abrasive against the rounded bass sound before you get this crashing thrum of guitar noise that just it's so serrated and harsh. Lydon's vocals brim with disdain and disgust and the, it just sounds like he's a man drowning against the din of noise. The track is also achingly insistent. It powers on for 10 minutes before petering out amidst these crashes and drum fills and Lydon comically warbling. And you can't help but feel that, that having that as the first track on the album was designed to test the listener. You know, at this point it was established that punk wasn't quite as caustic as people 
people originally thought it was. Therefore, musicians like Lydon had to take it to the next level, and boy does Albatross do that. Those metallic elements can be heard throughout the album, or on the track Memories, those grating hi-hat sounds sound like they're reverberating on a tin roof or something, uh, and on the track Swan Lake, guitarist Levine rubs a pick up and down his strings, and it just creates this metallic thrum that echoes through the entire song. Lydon's own experimentation in recording technique is crucial to this album's sound as well. Uh, at one point in the evening when they're recording and he was out of ideas, he placed an ashtray on the strings of the piano, and he really liked the sound, so what he did was is he lay underneath the piano, uh, underneath the strings, recorded his vocals with the mic above uh, the ashtray and the strings. And what that did, that created a dark, foreboding spaciousness to the recording. And what a great way to harness your environment around you and use the objects around you to create a unique sound. One of my favourite tracks here is Graveyard, a track that's actually more influenced by dub than it is punk. Um, the, the bass on the track is, is so low that it actually, it's uncomfortable to listen to on headphones. It feels like something's crushing your skull. Uh, over the top you have this jagged guitar melody uh, and then also uh, the, the hi-hat's doing this open hi-hat groove. Um, the whole thing is just so insistent and driving and, and unique and unusual that the album's an absolute classic. Go and listen to it. And number five, Gang of Four, Entertainment, also released in 1979. What an album to end on. Gang of Four are a post-punk band from the northern city of Leeds, uh, and they're an altogether different beast from the bands that I've spoken about on this video so far. Really, the album is as much post-punk as it is funk, in a way. And it makes it the most danceable record on this list so far, although that's not really saying that much, is it? The production and instrumentation on Gang of Four's debut album, Entertainment, is punchy as hell, uh, the bass guitar forms this basis of funk that grounds the track and allows guitarist Andy Gill to unleash a torrent of riffs that kind of jar just as much as they force you to your body to move in mysterious ways. It, it's, uh, it's inaccessible and accessible at the same time. The clean tones of the guitar work, along with the vivacious bass lines, create something that's very um, infectious and catchy, and they're not words that you would perhaps attribute post-punk to, or you wouldn't expect me to have been using when we're talking about this style of music. But that allows me to make a bigger point about post-punk. You know, it's, it's not defined by convention. In a way, that's what the form was about. That's what post-punk is about. It's a freehold on convention and a freedom of expression to create music that isn't held down by specific ideas or notions. And that, that experimentation allows bands to create the sort of music that is in this top five, stuff that's very unique and uh, very engaging um, and original as well. And I'm glad that there isn't, uh, there aren't stapled conventions that I can attribute post-punk to because in a way that would negate the, the point of the, of the style of music in the first place. Gang of Four are also a politically motivated band, something that they ensured came across throughout entertainment. On opening track Ether, vocalist John King alludes to the uh, violence being hidden from the public and uh, the, I guess, the evil of capitalism. Dig at the root of the problem, fly the flag on foreign soil, it breaks your new dreams daily H block long cash, father's contradictions, censor six counties news, and breaks your new dreams daily, each day more deaths. Bit of a tongue twister that one. This is very much a part of the band's collective interest in Marxist critique and Marxism, uh, and that informs the music lyrically. It makes the album very politically motivated, and it gives the whole album lyrically a uh, very much a focus. The track instrumentally is such a great start to the record. You have this punchy staccato bass alongside Hugo Burnham's um, off-kilter idiosyncratic drum rhythm that just refuses to place the snare on the two and the four as you'd expect to hear and it just perfectly complements Guild's off-kilter guitar phrases. Damaged Goods was the debut single from the band and in a way it's probably the most accessible track on the record. Uh, you have this syncopated bass line worming its way through an almost motoric drum groove and, and a funk guitar riff uh, alongside King um, sort of shouting, singing about sexual politics. The, these guys just never switch off throughout this entire record and I, and I mean that in an entirely good way. Uh, it just has so much energy to it and I know I've used that little term energy to pretty much every every album um, here, but, but Gang of Four do just have this propulsive energy and entertainment is a great showcase of that. Um, it's, it's a brilliant album as are the other four albums I've talked about. And I could talk about these albums a lot more, um, but to be honest, I hope I've given you... <coughs> See, I'm really ill, this is why. 
<laughs> this is why the video was late this this uh, this week. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Tell a friend about Deep Cuts. Get involved in the community in the comment section below. Discuss your favourite post-punk albums. Which ones I omitted that you wish I'd included. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I'll be back again uh, in a few days with uh, another video. And that'll be my January review roundup. So look out for that one. Um, if you fancy having a chat with me or following me on Twitter, then follow me at Deep Cuts Tweets. I'm often on there just chatting about whatever uh, happy to just discuss music and, and all sorts of, on there <clears throat> god i'm i am literally dying still um yeah i'll see you next week <laughs>